hit record this time for once, rather than yank it off the Twitch stream. As a reminder, we have our midterms next week, in case if you are not paying attention to the multiple reminders I put out. So that starts on Wednesday, and I hope you're all ready. I am looking forward to not having to be the one that talks all class. So I will let you do all that. And the best part of being a professor is when you can let your students take over. <laughs> Alrighty, so last time we left off with the sequence diagram, right? So I gave you a highlight, well, high level overview of kind of what these look like. All right, we have our classes, we have our execution windows or focuses, foci of control, I suppose. Um, and then we pass messages along kind of our timeline, All right? And these are basically just function invocations. So this is where we left off. And again, we are in the behavioral side of UML. So things are now um, all about collaboration, all about communication and message passing. And basically, this is where we actually start seeing how we can make these diagrams kind of interact with each other. So um, I actually have some formal definitions here for you. And I'll put these up for the class diagrams as well when I ask you to go ahead and make them. Sorry, I forgot to uh, um, rip my sleeves because I realized that I get inordinately warm whenever I teach and it becomes uncomfortable and uh, class gets very bad from my perspective. Um, so here we have basically the things that go into a class diagram. And again, it, it would be similar, or sequence diagram, it'd be similar for a class diagram where we'd have particular symbols and relationships and what they all mean and all that fun stuff. So actors, same thing for use case diagrams, stick figure or a box that calls it an actor. Uh, here we have our classes, and this is where we can kind of merge together an object diagram and a class diagram if we want. All right, so here an object colon a class. So in this diagram, we actually see it's just a class basically, right? A class. Or it would be some actor like this server here. Should be denoted actor, but the, this particular figure didn't do that. Uh, and again, the dashed lines going vertically are your lifelines. This is where this object is alive over time. And if the object gets killed off or destroyed, you put an X at the bottom. All right, so that would be the X here. Um, only thing we didn't really talk about were guard condition and frames. So nothing that you've seen has had a frame. Basically, that would just be the boundary of the sequence diagram. What is the context of it, right? Here, the frame would be bank transaction. Here it would be art auction. So you'd put a frame around it just to let your coworkers or collaborators know what the purpose of the diagram is. Um, but guard condition... This is an interesting one because you haven't seen any of them in the examples. Now, here, for instance, we have our messages, right? Our function invocations. I could put a guard on here that says user has card or card is real or, you know, something that would guard that I'm not shoving like a handful of mud into the ATM or, or something unexpected. Basically, this is your if statement saying this particular function can only be called if this particular guard is true. So does that make sense? Basically, you just want to make sure that whatever is going to enable this function to be called, basically you have a condition that it's a valid pathway. Again, it's basically just an if statement. Um, for those of you doing games or something graphical, if you want to draw a sprite to the screen or draw a 3D model, your guard would be that you have the texture loaded. Otherwise, you try to draw something with a null reference and your game crashes. Right. So basically, you need a guard condition for, um, for messages that basically require it, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, but the takeaway here, again, sequential interaction, collaboration, um, communication to an extent. So here's another yet grainy example of a sequence diagram. So here we have basically a patient and a receptionist. 
and we are doing a medical booking basically so i have to create an appointment so here we have two people and we've denoted them with a in front of their name so that we know that's basically a real person in a way or a particular patient here we have request request appointment goes to the receptionist receptionist would look up the patient and then we would see if this particular patient instance exists right so if this patient exists and there's your guard condition we can look up if they have any say unpaid bills we have a class for that we have a class for appointments um, you know assuming that they don't have any unpaid bills maybe we look to see what appointments are available and then we create an appointment if one is available and here you'd probably expect to see like a return value with is valid or is not valid or booking available booking unavailable uh, but that's kind of hand waved away here we're assuming that would be the the function return and then you can create an appointment and again you would expect either a return value of the appointment instance or it being entered into the system in some way but that might be out of the scope of this particular diagram here um, but yeah hopefully the sequence diagram makes sense more or less right again if you don't remember from last time start at the top left and just follow the arrows and you should be okay right it all kind of flows to the right or flows along the path of the arrows downwards so right down right down okay nothing comes back go back to the last one right down um, and then what we can do let's say we assume that we get data back maybe we have to change the appointment maybe we can provide this user with possible appointment times so we have arrows going this way again that just means that we have a message being passed in this direction it doesn't strictly have to be a function return going right to left the only reason i mentioned that is all the examples have shown basically the solid arrows going right they can go left too just depends who is talking to what or who's talking to whom so that sequence diagrams kind of in a nutshell if you have any questions please feel free to let me know or on class diagrams from last time as well uh, now we have an actual process for building these things so first and foremost set the context what's the context that's basically your frame here right what is the purpose of this interaction um, and if you go really further down the rabbit hole you can set all kinds of interactions with other diagrams too when you start doing things like verifying and validating them or balancing them you know making sure that each actor exists in the use case diagram as well as the sequence diagram that you're modeling and basically <clears throat> that's a little further down the pipeline but one thing to keep in mind is that there should be consistency between your models otherwise you have basically bad models effectively all right so set the context figure out who is interacting here so what actors are necessary what objects are necessary do you need classes do you need object instances right what do you need right this top layer here who's participating in the particular sequence then we set the lifeline and basically this is doing, again just going to be a dashed line all the way throughout depending on your object it might end earlier right so if we create an appointment uh, let's say that i request an appointment tomorrow at 9 a.m okay the receptionist creates an appointment and then I have an interaction where he needs to cancel it. Well, this appointment then would die because it needs to be destroyed because it no longer exists. So that'd be one way that your lifeline would kind of end earlier. All right, so we'd set the lifeline and then add your messages. So show the flow of information from one object to another. Show the interactions, right? If you have any um, particular parameters that need to be passed in, like patient ID, patient name, uh, username, password, whatever you need to model out, put that in there, right? And here we have uh, name and address coming in as parameters, important to know for this particular sequence, so we include it. Um, common things that you probably would assume would be there, you don't strictly have to put in right, to kind of simplify things. But if it's important to know, add it in. And if you're wondering, well, what's important, what's not important, 
just think that you're giving this model to somebody else and figure out are they going to assume that I know that the name and password has to come in or should I specify it? To me, over specifying is usually a better thing in a way because you don't make any assumptions. <laughs> but then you get slightly more complicated diagrams, so there's a trade off there. Um, but yeah, obvious return values you can exclude, like returning a void or returning, in this case, an appointment. You know, we kind of assume an appointment comes back up to your preference if you want to include it or not. I would, these people did not. They're both, both would be valid diagrams. So there's a little bit of play here, I suppose, with what is strictly necessary and strictly not. But just make sure that whoever you're giving it to knows and understands your intent. Okay, so you've gotten this far, you know, we've added our messages, then add your execution windows, your focus of control, and I'm using multiple terms for the same thing here. Basically show that this object is executing at this point in time. All right, so this execution window for the patient class is a lot smaller than the actual person, right? The receptionist is alive in this scenario for the entire time, but the unpaid bill is only there for a short time. And then once you're done, validate the sequence diagram. And what this means is to basically take a step back and read your diagram and make sure that it all makes sense. Okay, actually go through the process, um, either mentally or writing it out, starting here, what is happening in my system, right? So actually follow the arrows yourself. So if you were to create a diagram here, right? You pretend you are a patient, your teammate is a receptionist, go through the steps of trying to set up an appointment and does the sequence diagram accurately model your process or here, go back to your bank account. Um, example, you are the customer, you have an ATM. What are the steps of getting money out of an ATM? Well, I take out my wallet, I get my bank card out. I put the card in the ATM, the ATM does some stuff and then I get money back, hopefully. And does this accurately reflect that? This is the validation aspect of things. <clears throat> Basically, just make sure you're not missing anything or that something is wonky and you're unclear, right? If you're unclear on something, then there's probably a problem. Okay, I just realized I'm overlaid right on top of Charlie here. Uh, any questions on sequence diagrams before we move on to communication? Is we're gonna do communication diagrams and then we're gonna start talking about design patterns. And then after your midterms, I will probably have you all build some more UML. So make sure you get your questions answered. And I'm hiding some text, that's never good. No, let's not move the whole thing. That's a silly, silly thing to do. Let's move me up there. Alrighty, so communication diagram. This is, if you remember last time, I mentioned that communication and sequence diagrams basically show the same thing. Semantically, yes, they're showing message passing and communication and interactions. Um, this is looking at it from a different perspective. So here we're basically showing um, a path between objects and we are basically adding a number to each path. So what is the time order of the message. And this will be incremented like message one, message two, message three, so that you can very easily see what order things are happening in. And it looks different from the sequence diagram. I'm going to show it to you in the next slide here. But basically, I just want you to uh, kind of consider that all that somewhat complicatedness of the sequence diagram, we're showing effectively similar things here in the communications diagram. So. This one is not as pretty. Let me pop over to this one here, and then I'll come back and talk about the rest of the material there. But you basically have kind of a more natural flow of things in a way. However, it can be a little bit more complicated to read depending on things. So here we have our make appointment use case. 
And we're basically showing the same thing as that sequence diagram, again, with that slightly pixelated textbook figure um, from the last time. So here we have our patient, receptionist, and then our various classes in the system, right? And here are the messages being passed. Request appointment, look up patient. Patient exists, look up bills, okay? Do we have a new appointment, cancel appointment, change an appointment? What are the appointment times? Match appointments, create appointment. Right, so this is our medical appointment creation sequence diagram, just kind of distilled into a little bit of a cleaner view, I suppose. So we're seeing the same thing here, right? And this message ID that you see at the top here, that's your ordering. This is your time series. So request appointment, then look up patient. If we go back here, request appointment, look up patient. So they're in order, right? And it's ordered by this ID. We also see the arrow indicating the path of the message. So for each of these invocations, we say which direction it's going because you can have multiple messages being created on one particular line, right? So I can't just put an arrow here and assume that it's valid for every message. No, because we can have multiple things happening with one interaction. What does this get us? You know, why do we have a similar view of the same data, just a different diagram? Here we are really honing in on the dependencies, the interactions. Whereas before we have kind of a very high level view, you know, there could be a lot of information being demonstrated in a sequence diagram. Here we are really kind of focusing on the objects and how they interact. That kind of makes sense. So we're showing dependencies, right? We're showing relationships. So here's a slightly different view with very blocky lines, but we get the same thing, right? So here we have a librarian and we need to figure out things related to the, the library book checkout process. So the librarian talks to the user interface. Um, basically trying to figure out information if somebody can borrow a book. So again, we see the arrows indicating the flow of data. We have a feedback loop here. So basically, if we have an invalid message, we're going to follow this until you know the librarian resolves the problem. And then we can figure out, hey, can you check it out? Is it overdue? Do we create a fine for this person? Right, if, if the book's overdue, you get charged a fine. And interestingly, here we actually see return data for once, which is kind of nice. So if your media is overdue, you can create a fine in the system. So basically, we're getting a fine shipped this way, and we're getting the amount of the fine shipped this way. So that would go into the user interface. And since the context here only shows the librarian, right, there's no user, basically, this would just get logged into the system, and that's the end of it. But if you added a person, like a borrower, then you would also put the amount to them, and then there'd probably be methods for paying the fine and stuff like that, right? That's probably out of context for this one. So here, again, same data, just different view. And the point is that you can honestly create one from the other without losing any information. And that's kind of an important thing. Right, if I wanted to create a use case or a class diagram from a use case diagram, um, you know, I can probably get everything that I need out of it, but there's a chance that I don't have all the information in one or the other to create a full set of um, representative models. Whereas here, I have all of the information I need, right? Method calls, parameters, guards, direction, return values, it's all semantically equivalent. So here's one more view of the communications diagram where basically everything is kind of spelled out. So if you are not following what I'm saying, um, it's all kind of arrowed over here. But you have your, they call it a lifeline. This is an actor. This is a class, right? Uh, you can instantiate things too as an object name and class name, just like in the other diagram. This calls it a lifeline name, but basically it's your object name. Um, what else in here that is slightly different? 
And it's basically the same thing. But if anybody's unclear on the distinction, please feel free to let me know in the chat. But to me, it should be pretty obvious what you know you have to do. If you understand sequence diagrams, communication diagrams are the same thing. Again, what do we care about here for building them? Context, important. What's the context of this? It's an online bookshop interaction. Okay, we're buying books. We're dealing with the shopping cart. It makes sense. What's the context here? A person wants to make an appointment. One thing you might notice too, some of these frames reference a use case. This is basically a use case. So in our use case diagram, we probably have something called make appointment. We probably have something called um, query card or something like that, or get money. Or we have something called and spacing on verbs <laughs> by masterpiece or something like that. So these sequence diagrams and communications diagrams typically are tied to use cases. So those use cases you created before, you could really create sequence or communication diagrams from them. And what are these classes? Well, these are your class diagrams, right? So what is a patient class? What is an unpaid bill class? Well, you have all your attributes and methods. And hopefully you can kind of see how this all gets tied together. Hopefully, anyway. All right, so the communications diagrams. How many more do we have? This is the last one here. OK. So context, figure out who is interacting, what the associations are. Lay out the diagram. This is an important one where it's very easy to let these diagrams get super complicated. Why am I right clicking so much? Sorry about that. It's very easy to let these diagrams get over complicated really quickly. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever done like circuit designs or circuit layouts where you have lines like overlapping like crazy. The point here is to keep things simple. Don't let lines overlap other lines. It gets really hard to read really quickly. Uh, you don't want any of those like little line jumps if you can avoid them. So laying things out usually applies to any diagram, but definitely here. All right, add your messages, validate the model. Again, make sure it makes sense and life is good, hopefully. OK, that is it for UML. Does anybody have any questions at all? Or does everything make sense? So we had basically three days of UML talking about these one, two, three, four, five types of diagrams. Hopefully it makes sense. And the goal here, again, really, it's not to create unnecessary work for all of you. Depending on your perspective, you could see UML is annoying. You could see it as extra work. And depending on your viewpoint, you might be right. <laughs> you might be wrong. It just depends on the needs of your particular situation. But you can take care of so many logical errors and so many easy to fix problems if you just lay out a few simple models. And again, I know that a lot of you are starting to get really deep into your implementations for your term projects, right? Because a lot of you are probably working on your demos for next week and all that fun stuff. But if you encounter something that is like a really tricky problem to solve, there's a good chance you could have caught it at the model level. And I'm not saying that you should have done modeling, right? I didn't tell you to do that. This is more for like future knowledge, I suppose. So let's talk now about how we can apply commonly used patterns to our programming and to our models, right? So this is a software engineering class. We are basically looking at things from a process perspective, from a model perspective. Design patterns are basically things that you can apply to, or really any level of your software. We're going to talk about it in terms of the model level, but basically these have direct code implementations. Um, and I should probably start stop introducing it since I have slides talking about this here momentarily. 
Well, I guess I should probably set the context because it is important. But these are things which you should be aware of, right? Those of you going into more object-oriented languages like Java, Python, C++, stuff like that, these are going to be, honestly, lifesavers if you can understand them and figure them out. They will save you so much time is if you put in like a little bit of extra work up front and it's not just code effort it's mental effort because some of these you have to wrap your head around to understand what are they talking about <laughs> but once you figure them out it's really helpful and one of the things that we'll also look at is anti-patterns as well so anti-patterns are basically things that you should not do ever Right? This is a bad programming practice. Um, and identifying that you're doing something like that is basically like realizing that you royally screwed up and you don't want to be doing this. Now, the thing with like anti-patterns, I don't want to you know, make you all horrified that you're all terrible programmers or anything like that. But your code probably will still work. Right? Let's say you implement, there's one called the God class where everything is one massive class. Will your code work if you do that? Sure, work fine. You probably wouldn't even notice. The problem is once you start trying to extend functionality later on, or maybe you start looking at performance metrics and you're realizing it actually performs kind of shittily. <laughs> Why? Because there's just so much loaded into memory, for instance, or you know, there's a lot of things going on there. But the key here is that there is a lot of effort in programming that's been done you know, since we started programming. And there are a ton of industry examples and a ton of academic examples. And people have kind of boiled them down into patterns called design patterns um, that are very common. These ones are good. These ones are bad. So take that for what you will. So we're going to basically talk about them at a high level. Then we're going to talk about some of the different categories. Because again, we have multiple flavors of a design pattern, just like with our UML, different focuses. And then we'll talk about three particular examples, uh, one from each of the categories. There are a lot of design patterns, and honestly, people are adding more yearly. So it's not like we're set in stone in the 2000s, this is all the design patterns. No, we're still discovering them. And then I'll give you some few further reading if you would like, and we're not going to get to that today, obviously. Uh, quick poll. Has anybody ever seen this textbook before? Some of my grad students saw it and shuddered. So this is a very common textbook if you ever take a class that deals with design patterns. Right, we're only going to have a few lectures on it, basically. But um, if you have any class focusing on them, it's probably going to be this textbook. And I will say, if you, you know, this is going to be an interesting set of modules because you're going to love it or you're going to hate it, right? If you're somebody like me who just brute forces the hell out of your code, design patterns are something that you do later. <laughs> That's because I'm not a good programmer. I'll, I'll, I'll be more than happy to admit it, but it works. Um, but this is where you get into like the elegant side of code. And this book is awesome for going through each pattern and showing you how to implement things. I actually gave a, a PhD student this textbook to read for one of his qualifying exams, basically, because he needed to learn about design patterns for his PhD work. So read this textbook, answer these questions, and you'll be good. So it's definitely a good book if you're interested. I'm not saying you should go out and buy it, but um, it's definitely a, a key if you like hard copy. So what is a design pattern then? So it is something that basically abstracts out a common set of uh, tasks that you would have to do, or it kind of abstracts out a particular activity. And it gives you basically a particular model pattern that you then implement. All right, so let me maybe give you an example here that helps. I have a website. Right, I'm, I'm sure all of you probably have made websites at this point, or at least have seen HTML code if you've never written a website. Well, you make a very simple website. It's just going to be straight up HTML. Maybe you're going to get frisky and add some CSS in there to make it pretty. 
I'm going to go even more frisky and you're going to add some JavaScript in there to make things happen while the page is loaded and life is good, right? Okay. You start working and your websites become data-driven web applications where now it's not just like a GeoCities website with a little under construction spinning GIF kind of thing. It is you're pulling out of a database, you're rendering different pages, right? We are building a storefront or a customer experience or whatever it is, okay? That's fine. And if you just code it like you would have a straight up HTML page, it's going to be very, very hard to maintain. And why do I say that? Well, if you have to make every single page, they're basically all doing the same thing, right? Just the different calls to the backend database. Right, show product inventory or show prices or buy object or 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 right. So we basically have all these different pages that you have to render out to create. They're still pulling from this database. There is some back end that handles all the code. And kind of what I'm getting towards is if any of you have ever heard of the model view controller kind of architecture, that's pretty similar to a design pattern. And what you do is you take web development, you make it very complicated. And when I say complicated, usually you have a framework that handles this where you have a view. So basically there's all these little scripts that are view scripts where it's basically how does this particular widget get rendered, right? This is the body, this is the sidebar, this is the footer, maybe this is the home page. And instead of having index.html, um, your index.html is a bunch of these little view models, view modules. And then your model is how the data is re uh, represented internally in your program. And then your controller could be how you're routing people from page to page in the website. And I'm kind of describing this to make it sound complicated because it is. But the cost benefit to doing this actually makes it easier in the long run. Okay, I need to change how all of the data is represented in the database because we're going from MySQL to MongoDB or something. Well, I just changed the model. I don't have to fix every single web page now. See, if you're, if any of this doesn't sound familiar, there are like PHP frameworks out there like CodeIgniter or CakePHP. These are older ones now. But basically, they are whole environments that you apply this thing to. This could be an example of a design pattern. Where is it a design pattern? I don't think I actually have a picture of it in the slide. So let me do a quick image search because I wasn't expecting to talk about it, but it's a good example. Um, don't search for models in Google Images with Safe Search off, by the way. Bad idea. Um, almost did that the other day. Do, 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 do. All right, so open image in new tab. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, no, <laughs> no, come back. There we go. All right, so model view controller. You could think of this like a design pattern, right? There are actually classes associated with the models, with the controller, with the view. So we basically separate out the different aspects of our design here we are applying this well-known pattern to a particular application. So let me go one more quick step. Model view controller, class diagram. Here we go. Stack overflow, that's gotta be correct, right? I just want this one, that's all I wanted. So here, we have a class diagram of a model view controller, right? So it's very simplified. Obviously, we'd have a lot more in here, but the view would create things that you look at. But the data coming into this would be formatted by the model and based on your particular access, whether you're accessing the home page or the shopping cart, the controller would route you and basically populate your model. The data from the model would be populating the view. And by separating things out in this way, basically I can work on the front end or the back end, or again, part of the back end without impacting any of the other modules. Is it complicated? Yes. Um, is it needlessly complicated? I would say no, because this is something that actually makes, again, kind of your life easier in a way. 
So these are proven solutions to recurring problems. And since I know that a lot of you are probably stuff, not unless you're using Angular. Well, let's leave the Angular discussion to another day, I suppose. <laughs> uh, fun. But a proven solution to a recurring problem. These are basically like functions on steroids, right? Because that's what a function does. We have a solution and we're just going to apply it multiple times. So what do we mean by proven and how does communication fit in? So by proven, we mean that time and time again, for a long time in programming, these particular patterns have emerged and they have solved problems. So that is the whole purpose of this, right? We know that these patterns are useful. If you don't apply them, your code will probably still work. It might be just more difficult to maintain or to extend or, 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 or. Now, how does communication fit in here? Communication, if you remember from last set of slides, this is passing messages back and forth, right? So that is data flow. So this is our communication side. And hey, this book also has a forward by Grady Booch, one of the UML experts. So there you go. <clears throat> There's another aspect of communication too, and that's team communication. So communication can be our methods and our models, right? Communication can also be at the team level, and that's where I was kind of trying to get the point across that UML is not just for building code bases, it's also for team communication to simplify ideas, right? To convey information to your teammates and your project managers and your, your business partners and all that. Same idea here. If I'm going to apply the MVC design pattern or the observer or the singleton or the visitor or facade or any of them that are out there, I can tell one of you we're doing facade for this and you should know what that means, right? This is a common terminology that you would use if you're an object-oriented developer. You can implement this in something procedural like C as well, where you don't have classes. Um, you just have to do some pointer magic, basically. So again, same principle applies for these design patterns. They do really well with Java, C Sharp, Python. They will work in C. It's just extra effort if you want to do it. And if you want to learn C, get comfortable with function pointers, because this is all going to be function pointers. Okie dokie. So last point, and I mentioned this already, improve modifiability and maintainability of code. Right? It's very easy to write a spaghetti mess of code that, again, it works. You have your software release, so life is great. And then the client finds a problem in the field oh crap, we have an issue with our encryption algorithm for our mobile app, right? We're leaking customer data to the web. Okay, well, how do we fix this? Um, well, if we want to encrypt all the data, I, now I need to insert a bunch of encrypt and decrypt function calls through a million lines of code. That's going to be a massive, massive pain to a fix and be test. If I've applied a particular pattern that abstracts out data flow, instead of several thousand lines of code that have to be fixed, I just have to do one module. Right, so think of applying, the whole point of this is that you are applying a, not complicated, but a complex concept. You are overlaying it onto your existing application, and you're going to reap the benefits of doing that. You're saving yourself time later on. And it doesn't have to be hard at the outset, right? I'm not trying to make this sound like a horrible effort, but it requires a little more abstract thinking, just to keep in mind. So what do we care about here? Why are we studying them and what are they basically made up of? Right, so we're gonna be looking at some of these nifty object-oriented design strategies that are out there um, that you don't necessarily talk about if you come out of the procedural world like C or Pascal or any of those like common first year languages that you used to get, right? You're all getting Java, so you know object oriented, hopefully. Um, but here we're going to do things like 
we're going to use encapsulation, right? We're going to have classes kind of subsume other classes. We may do some information hiding where you have that protected or private designator, like not everything's public. Um, by doing information hiding, we can force access through things like interfaces or things like subclasses. You know, we might be doing composition of classes instead of just inheriting data from elsewhere. Basically, you're going to leverage some of these object-oriented tricks that we know, and we're going to design them to be some kind of a pattern. That's kind of the whole point here. So, should make sense. And again, you all should have had intro to Java, right? So, at the very least, you should be aware of object-oriented programming, because that's what you did. But now we're going to bump it up a level here. Good tea. Just getting sick of coffee. All right, so let me pop all these guys in here. Um, so design patterns, this is basically, I'm going to be talking about a dictionary of techniques effectively. And when we do something like that, we need to have kind of an understanding of what the particular descriptors are for this pattern. So what do we care about here? Uh, we care about the intent, right? So I guess maybe I should animate this in, otherwise it's too much text on the screen. What is the problem that we're dealing with? Is it going to be access rights or information hiding? Maybe we need to be able to swap out algorithms on the fly behind the scenes. A common example would be you have to sort something, right? And you all probably, hopefully, know that there are a million types of sorting for an array, right? Do your bubble sort or your radix sort or your quick sort whatever your favorite sorting algorithm is. They have different benefits, right? Well, one example of a design pattern would be to just call application.sort. And you could pick bubble sort, radix sort, quick sort on the fly based on other things. Does the person talking to the front end know this? No, they just know that sorting is happening. But behind the scenes, the design pattern has picked the algorithm for that particular point in time. So we can kind of get around this by basically, you know, you'd use a function pointer in C to swap out which function we're looking at. Or here, we might just pick a different subclass. So what's the problem that we care about, right? There's tons of problems in programming. Which pattern applies to this? Uh, then we're going to describe the structure of the pattern. So what is the UML class diagram of this pattern? Right? What are the classes necessary? What are the relationships, the associations, attributes, methods? What's protected? What's private? What's public? Basically, everything we just talked about, we'll describe a design pattern. We also need to know who's participating. So which classes are interacting with this pattern? What is their responsibility? And what are their interactions with other classes? So basically, who is going to be in this particular pattern? How do they collaborate? Again, what messages are being passed? And we also probably get to talk about the consequences of this pattern. What are the trade-offs? What are the results? Why would you use this pattern? Right? Maybe there is a particular pattern where adding it adds a whole extra layer of complexity, very difficult to understand and implement, but the benefit is that it runs 10 times faster, or that it is 20 times more maintainable later on. All right, so then we'll also talk about the implementation. So what are some of the things to be aware of when you're implementing? What are the gotchas? How would you actually implement this thing? All right, how, how does it all work together? So this is kind of the high-level categories you'd use to describe a design pattern, oh, as well as sample code. There you go. Forgot to animate that one in. <clears throat> Alrighty, so <clears throat> what we've got is, well, let me, I, I guess let's talk about who is, who created it, and then, then we'll look at them, and then we'll probably end. So UML had the three amigos, right? Um, there was the gang of four that did the early work on design patterns. Um, so basically, these people here, do, 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 do. come on, I've got this highlighted, okay. 
hey, there they are. They created this textbook. <clears throat> they started out by describing 23 patterns. Um, and basically, they didn't create the patterns. They only observed them in reality and category, ca cataloged them. So this is basically what was come up with here. So we have creational methods, we have structural methods, and we have behavioral methods. So the bolded ones are the ones that I'm going to show you, but basically there are a whole lot of different methods out there. Right? So we have the factory method. We have a prototype method. We have composite method. We have iterators. We have the strategy pattern, the visitor pattern. Basically, all of these different patterns describe a different way of implementing code. So each of these has a class diagram associated with it. Each of them has sample code associated with it. Here is how you would implement this pattern in your code base. All right, so I'm not going to talk to each of them. But we're going to basically focus on these three to give you an example of the different types of patterns that are out there. But to kind of talk about what these different categories mean, creational is basically handling the, the instantiation process. So if I have to create a bunch of objects when my program runs, for instance, the creational patterns will help you with that. So what are the intricacies of instantiating a bunch of classes in your system? Creational helps there. Right? So singleton would be one of these where we are only ever creating a single instance of one class, and you're not allowed to ever create any more. So that'd be a creational. Structural, how things are composed to create larger structures. So if you remember composition, right? we have a bunch of parts, and we have a whole that we make out of all these parts. Basically, the structural are going to describe kind of these complicated class relationships in a way. And we're going to take that, and we're going to create possibly new functionalities just by organizing our patterns differently. Uh, and then the behavioral should make sense as the opposite of structural, opposite of structural. We're going to talk about interactions, flow of data, um, algorithms, cooperation. So basically what you know from your structural and your behavioral diagrams, structural and behavioral patterns act pretty similarly, where the focus is either how you create things or structure them or how they interact. All right, so what we'll do next time is we'll talk about Singleton and all of the other ones. Um, I think there's anything else. I don't think so. So, yeah, next time we'll, we'll talk about these patterns. We'll do some classwork. And yeah, that's about it. Anybody have any questions for today? Thank you, Google Calendar. I needed that last in my ears. All right, other than that, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Um, enjoy the rain. Looks like we're going to have it for a while. I will see you all on Monday. Goodbye, everybody. How are the kiddos? The kiddos are delightful, I think. Yeah, they're, they're delightful. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. It's funny you ask that because in my grad class Wednesday night, one of them just started screaming bloody murder. <laughs> You're going to watch Borat too. I probably will. It released today, right? I saw there is already a mega thread on Reddit about it. Should be uh should be delightful. <laughs>